Kimura is the CTO of Jumpbox, uh, which I've been using since 2008. Uh, tests all sorts of cool software. So I'm, it's it's I'm really excited that you're playing with Docker and looking at it. I love it. I think it's great. <laughs> and it seems like, as you were saying, it seems like there's a theme for the presentations. Yes. It's all talking about dev, dev yes. environments and orchestration. All right, so this is orchestration for multi-container Docker environments. I guess you could say it's kind of poor man's orchestration or simple orchestration or what the hell are we really going to do with this orchestration stuff. So uh, just something to get started with. Um, and the, the goal of this is just to be able to quickly provision multi-container environments on a single uh, machine. Uh, the specification is, is declaratively specified uh, in uh, YAML. Um, it automatically builds the images if you want it to. So you can use a Docker file or you can use give it a URL to a Git uh, repository and it'll pull the, pull the co uh, code and look for a Docker file and build it. <coughs> it synchronizes the startup order. So if you declare a bunch of services that need to be started in a particular order, it will uh, start them in that order. And it will wait for the dependent services to actually respond uh, to uh, the port that they're, that they're supposed to be publishing on before uh, starting the next step in the uh, sequence. Um, so it gives you the ability to start, stop, destroy sets of containers as a, a group. Um, and you can also add containers to that group uh, while that, that environment is running. Um, and you can launch multiple copies of the same environment on the same uh, machine if you needed to do that. Uh, so if you're running, doing development on an app and for some reason you needed a couple different instances of it, uh, you, could, uh, you could easily launch uh, multiple, multiple environments. Um, this is what a, a configuration file looks like. Uh, it's just a YAML format. This defines two templates, a Node.js template and a MongoDB template. Uh, the Node.js template is um, based, uh, it has a custom Docker file that, it's, that uses, a, or that it, it uses to build, um, and that extends an existing base image that I had built and published to the Docker registry uh, for Node.js. Um, the config parameter um, is uh, basically mirrors the Docker API or the Docker command line API. So anything that you specify on the Docker command line, you can specify in the com config uh, portion of this. So whatever runtime parameters you would, you would want to provide, you can do that. Um, you can see here that the Node.js template has a require statement that depends on the MongoDB template and on port 27017 responding. Um, so if we go and do a little demo here, hopefully this works. Um, and all we have to do, we have, oops, let's back up. So if we look, we have a maestro.yaml file, and all we have to do is run maestro build, builds the MongoDB, builds the Node.js, and you can see in here that when this when it went to start the Node.js, it said that it's waiting for MongoDB. And so it will sit there and wait for a period of time. I think it waits 30 seconds uh, for that service to respond. Um, if the service doesn't respond, then it'll just shut the whole environment down and throw it away. Um, once MongoDB responds, then Node.js uh, will continue launching. And if we do Maestro PS, we can now see that we have two nodes. Um, running and one of them is publishing port 49156. Um, so if we go to hopefully we'll see uh, a very boring app, but it has the IP address for the Mongo server so it could connect um, to that. And um, we can s stop the entire environment. And we can restart, oops, restart the environment. It does the same thing again, synchronizes the start process. Um, and we can also stop um, individual nodes by name. Um, so I did Docker PS, but if we do Maestro PS, we get a node name. Um, so we can say, uh, stop the Node.js 
thing, if we look at it again, you'll see that it's now marked as stopped, and then of course we can restart it the same way. You can also run additional, so we can do uh, run Node.js, and this will run another copy of Node.js and put it into the environment, and it'll be published on a, on a different port. Um, if this had, say, a load balancer or something in there that was depending on the Node.js template, then the load balancer could reconfigure itself um, to, to provide that. This, this example doesn't have that. Um, another capability that it has is um, lots of talk about salt stack. Um, so if we look in here, there's a oops, there's a simple configuration. So this starts a salt master, and then it starts a salt minion. Actually, it'll start ten salt minions. And so if we just do maestro build, and this is going to take a second to build the templates. The minions are waiting for the salt master to come up. Salt master came up. Ten minions started and uh, registered themselves with the master. So again, we'll see now there are 10 uh, minions. And if we do a uh, Docker PS, we'll see that there's still my node and MongoDB instances are running, but Maestro gives me an isolated view of the, of the environment that I'm working with. Um, and of course, we can start and stop these as a unit, um, and if we SSH to There was something wrong with that. Um, this has a old password. Which I type. So this is the salt master. If we do salt key, we'll see all the, min the minions in the list. And we can do salt key dash A to ex oops. And I wish I could type. Uh, we can accept all of these keys. And we now have a 10 node minion environment that we could configure however we wanted to by using the salt command. So if we do, say, salt star uh, command dot run, I don't know, df dash h. Oops. So command dot run, yes. It'll give us the process list from every one of those independent minions. And. Um, that's probably about it. And so we can just do, well, we can do Maestro Destroy, which will shut down and destroy the entire environment, including all of the images, the containers, everything will be, will be wiped away. Um, so if you, if like one of the problems with Docker is that when you run a container uh, and that container exits, the container's still around, which sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not, sometimes it just clutters up your system. This will, will clean up the whole environment. I think that's probably about it. So, some questions? In your first example with the, the Node and Mongo app, you'd explicitly specified a port for Mongo, but I didn't see that show up in the port mapping when you did Docker PS. Uh, from Mongo? Mongo's not exposing the port because it's making the connection across the internal Docker network. Got it. Okay. I, I don't really know how that should, should work, whether it should, you know, if Mongo exposes the port, then it's exposed on the host. Which is, you know, questionable whether that's the right thing to do or not. Again, back to the, <laughs> how are we supposed to really do this stuff? Um, no. Yeah. So I have two questions. Uh, first, I noticed in the destroy of uh, this particular setup that the salt master was destroyed before all the minions shut down. Yeah. Uh, are you going to implement reverse dependency yes. destruction? Yes. Okay. Just hasn't been done. Fair enough. Second question is, are the Maestro environments isolated to their own dedicated network bridge interface? They are not currently. Uh, they probably should be. 
in order, if this were to, to be really useful for production deployments, then it would, they would almost certainly have to be. Uh, right now, they're not. First question is, uh, can you run multiple instances of a given setup? Because I noticed you said start, stop without arguments, but can I have like each yeah, so of those? Yeah, in, in so this, in this particular scenario, it's looking for a maestro.yaml file in the current directory. You, if you copy the maestro.yaml file to another directory, you can start a parallel copy of it. Um, I, I will add the ability to have global environments where you can just start a, uh, a new a named environment. So that. potentially you could play with the names to like sc scope things properly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my second question is, should uh, should Docker incorporate some of that, if anything? Like, I, I, I don't know, but like, it, it seems like would have, would are there some hooks missing basically that that made your life harder? Obviously yeah. the the uh, what is it? The, what's the proper term? It's not orchestration or service discovery. The, the thing we were talking about earlier today. Oh, I mean, service discovery? No. The, uh, the publishing of uh, IPs and so on. Oh, yeah. That, that's <laughs> very useful. Because this, this does it on its own by setting up environment okay. variables. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm saying, sorry, I meant other than that, since we discussed that. Yeah, okay, other than that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, it was not a subtle hint at our previous 45 minute conversation. <laughs> but, like, things like. Grouping or naming, I mean, does it, did it, feel, did it seem to you, because I, I have not tried to create a tool like this, so I don't have a feel for what belongs in Docker, if anything. I, I, it certainly feels to me like you should be able to name containers, um, just in general, or tag them, or in some way put some, some additional metadata on them, uh, so that it makes it easier to find them. Uh, and the, the, one of the weird things here is, like, you can see this Docker file, it has to do the uh, the add, um, and this this is actually a different example than I ran. Um, but this this does the add from a GitHub targz file because the add command, if you do a GitHub checkout, and uh, like so, like that Git repo has a maestro.yaml file in the root, just like you would put a Docker file. So just like you can do Docker build, and it'll automatically do that. You can do the same thing. Um, but the add command doesn't work with uh, um, in that scenario. It, well, because you pass the Docker file as standard input. Yeah, well, because I'm going through the Python API, so this is built on top of the Python API. So the add oh. command is is run on the server, and so you lose the context from the client going through the Python API to the server. Um, so that's a little bit of, this is the way that I worked around it, was to just do the ad based off of the URL. So that's probably the, the Python client library that's, that's yeah. are using uh, Docker PY? Doc, yeah. So it's probably lagging a little bit behind the receiver. Yeah, so well, you can do a build, you can do a full build. The 100% the of the Docker CLI uses the API, the, the remote API. So yeah, I mean, previous version of Docker Py, it had its own implementation of Builder, yeah. which that's been removed, and it now does the build on the server. Yeah. Um, so there's just some, and there's some usability things with that as well. Like, the, if you do a build that way, you don't get interactive output from it, but I think there may be something to it. So that's fixed in 05. I, I forgot to tell Jeff that also, because there was a hack in there to that. One of the limitations of Docker build or long was that for a long time you wouldn't get like the live output yeah. the way you expect it like in a in a pass environment. And so now that it does that. Yeah, so I, I guess I still don't know how to set that up because this like if the if the build fails, it just gets one big block of JSON back. Um, and uh, it would be nice to be able to. So we should we should probably give it And it comes at the end of the request. So even if it succeed, succeeds, you get one big block of JSON at the end of the request. So there's nothing you can you know, display uh, iteratively as the thing is building. Would you mind uh, opening an issue on the on Docker, Docker, the, the yeah. Python library repo, and to make sure we don't miss it? Okay. We'll make sure it's it's up to it's up to date. Yeah. Very cool. Any other questions? Uh, instead of the Docker commands here, can you give a file as an input? Uh, no. It has to be a URL. And that's, again, that's 
it, it, can can you do a Docker build? You know, you can't do it. You have to do it. You can only send a Docker file via standard in into Docker, right? No, There's, so the, that's actually a, a, a kind of an expert mode thing. The, the, the expected way is that, that is to do Docker build on the directory, and then it will expect the Docker file to be present in that directory. If yeah. you do that, then it can add anything relative to that directory. But if you want to, if you want to reference it, just a just a raw Docker file that lives somewhere else, then you have to do it. You basically have to feed it as standard in to Docker build. Yeah. You can't just say Docker build and then the name of a file. And, and then that creates weirdness with add as well. The, just the way add works feels weird to me. So I understand why it does that, but it feels weird. Um, and, and so, yeah, so the, the answer to your question is no. You can either do this, uh, a Docker file like this, or you can do the URL and pull it in from, from that way. Yeah, because, so yeah, sorry, Dan. No, because this may become very big if you put a big Docker file. It thinks it could be very modular if you can give this the file and its reference outside, which contains the Docker yeah. specific thing. But as you have more and more, it's going to be more. Yeah, this is I, I, I like this way where you, you create you know try to extract as much as you can into a base build that is is built out of out of this context. I think this is just customization of it for this specific specific use case. So that that I can't read it really well, but that there, the ads of that remote URL is that the remote URL for the same source code that the yeah. that the maestro.yaml file is in? Yeah. Which is kind of sucky. So you could, if you if you change the implementation, you could probably instead of piping the doc file in, you could probably just copy it, to, like write it, generate it, and like copy it to the local directory, and then Docker build it back. Yeah, except for I'm using the Python API. So oh, that, right, okay. that would, the that's API. making the Got assumption it. that I'm running on the same host yeah. as the Docker process. Got it. So is is the problem that when you run Docker add, it doesn't use the current working directory if you're piping it in from standard input? Yeah, I, it, you can explain what it what it's really doing more. I mean, it has a context that it works in that's not the current directory. It's, it, so when you when you type Docker build, you have to pass it a directory, and then the command figures out how to build that directory into a container. To do that, it looks for a Docker file. The Docker file tells it what to do step by step. One of these possible steps can be add, which is basically Hey, take, take a piece of that source directory, the, the, the context of the build that you're building from, and put it here in the container. So, so that's the part of like, things like upload the source, like tell the builder where to put the source in the, in the container, etc. Um, but it only works if there is a directory to build from. Right. right. Uh, but from the Python API, there's no way to specify the current working directory that. So apparently not. I, I, I don't know. I, oh. We'd have to. Because there's, there's a bunch of. I think there's like eight client libraries in different languages now. So, <laughs> uh, and I mean, Python, we don't really use because it's, 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 in, it's the first one and it's built within the cloud. But um, we're probably there's just a little bit of catch up to do. Yeah, as far as I know, nobody else has ever used this thing. So, <laughs> if somebody else decides to try it, <laughs> um, it's liable to blow up uh, spectacularly. But um, it might work. You never know. <laughs>